Hello, dear listeners. Before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to take a moment to address something important. During our recording, we encountered some unexpected network issues that affected, unfortunately, the audio quality of this episode. We sincerely apologize for any inconvenience this is going to cause during your listening experience. Please bear with us as we worked hard to ensure that the content's quality remains intact. Your understanding and continued support mean a lot to us. Thank you for joining us on this journey, and we hope you still enjoy the valuable discussions and insights shared in this episode. So, let's start. Hello, everyone. This is the Inside AI podcast, a show for researchers in life sciences that aims to answer real-life questions about microscopy, image analysis, and assistive AI practices. I am Benjamin a life sciences professional and the lead content creator at KML Vision. I bring several years of experience in biomedical sciences and biotechnology with a specialization in histology and image analysis. My co-host is Elisa, and together we will guide you through the world of AI in life sciences. Hi, everyone. I'm a content writer at KML Vision and a future doctor. With my experiences in scientific assistance, lecturing and academic coaching, I'm beyond excited to join this conversation and ask all the burning questions on your behalf. In this series, we will engage in thought-provoking conversations with scientists and researchers, giving you insights into their experiences. Let's kickstart this episode and unlock the secrets that lie within. Welcome everybody to today's interview. The topic today will be AI-supported quality assurance in stem cell bioprocessing. Elise and I are very excited to be speaking with Klaus Graumann today about the technological innovations and ongoing uh, initiatives within his organization Fenestra, uh, which is a company based in Austria. Hello Klaus, hope you're doing well. It's a pleasure for us to have you here and thank you for taking the time. I would like to ask you if you could introduce yourself very briefly and tell us uh, a bit about you. Yeah, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be on this podcast. My background is actually in biotechnology, and my speciality a long time ago was in downstream processing of proteins. And um, then I spent 20 years roughly in the biopharmaceutical industry at Bering Ingelheim and at Novartis. My first job at Novartis was a lab head job, and I ended up with being responsible for the drug substance development of Novartis Biologics um, after about 17 years, I left Novartis and decided to start uh, Fenestra together with a bunch of people. And I'm now the CEO of uh, Fenestra. And of course, uh, as a, we are in a startup, I'm doing everything basically that's that's needed, right? So I'm, of course, also looking into project management, business development, and sometimes I'm even in the lab. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means you have a quite in-depth industry background, but what motivates you or what drives you to, to launch your own business or to, to lead your own company? Uh, what really motivated me to leave my quite lucrative job at Novartis in Big Pharma uh, was really to the desire that was actually already starting a long time ago to run my own business, to start something as an entrepreneur, to build a successful business on my own with a team, of course. And specifically, I think stem cell biology really got me about more than 15 years ago, actually, when Professor Yamanaka invented iPSC technology. So this was really a, a defining point in time when I got interested into this area. And yeah, I was happy then that the opportunity found me then in the end. Since it's a startup, can you provide <laughs> an overview of Panestra's mission and elaborate a bit more about the field it is operating in? Panestra was designed with the idea to address topics which are related to manufacturability, scalability, and also product definition of uh, stem cell derived products, which are very complex biologics. And it's not only the cells, also products derived from stem cells that are basically in our scope. That is the gap you try to fill with this technology and your products? Access is one of our, let's say, targets and the gap that we see because we know that some of the therapies that are out there, in, in gene therapy especially, are hugely expensive and 
course, this is not sustainable in our view. Which platform technologies is Fenestra currently utilizing for stem cell bioprocessing? It's essentially three pillars uh, we are working on. First is the induced pluripotent stem cell technology, which, uh, as I mentioned before, was invented by Professor Yamanaka. The second pillar, I would say, is mesenchymal stromal cells, MSCs, which have also gotten a lot of interest over the last years as potential therapeutics. Uh, and we have here, in a collaboration with the company Eversight, uh, access to stable MSCs. They are telomerized, so they are overexpressing a fragment of the human telomerase enzyme. And uh, these cell lines have the opportunity or the big advantage that they are growing steadily and not changing their properties over many, many generations, which is in contrast to primary MSCs, which are very changeable, let's say. The third pillar is uh, actually cell-derived vesicles, which also have gotten a lot of interest. And of course, we can use high-quality cell lines, we can culture them, cultivate them. So it's just uh, obvious that we also have the opportunity to harvest cell-derived vesicles, which are naturally secreted from these cell lines that I mentioned before. I think that Maybe some of our listeners might not be aware of the main difference between IPSC and MSC. So IPCs or induced pluripotent stem cells generated from adult cells, right? Could be from any body cell. We are harvesting cells from urine. Usually people also take skin cells, fibroblasts from skin or cells from the blood. And with uh, certain tools, we can put these cells in a state that resembles the embryonic state of stem cells. The MSCs or mesenchymal stromal cells, on the other hand, they are specialized cells and can be found also in many tissues or even in all tissues of the human body. And they have a special function there. And they can be isolated and can also be differentiated, but only in a certain cell types like adipose tissue, chondrogenic tissue or bone. That means that IPSCs don't have any limitation in, in terms of differentiation. You can differentiate them into each and every cell type or tissue, right? That's correct. So they are really replacing, from our perspective, the embryonic stem cells, which have ethical issues, of course, which was also hindering the field, I think, more than 20 years ago. They, of course, have some genetic question marks, so you have to really take care that the genetic integrity is shown of these cells, that also the cultivation, for example, does not uh, lead to some genetic aberrations, which might then also be uh, deleterious for the process or even for the product. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned something very interesting. Um, you received the sample, so basically the somatic cells from human urine samples, right? That's correct, yeah. And what are the next steps then? So far as I can remember, um, somehow you need to introduce those damn cell associated genes into those cells, right? So that you can um, transform them into uh, iPSCs. What technologies do you use there? So we expand only a subset of the cells that you can find in urine. And then we introduce um, certain genes into these cells. We do this in a virus-free manner. There are different ways of doing it. We use episomal vectors, which are transfected, and this works very well in our hands and has also the advantage that we don't have to handle viruses in our laboratories. And uh, these episomal vectors also, after a few generations, are also removed then from the iPCs. So at the time point when we bank the iPCs, uh, usually these genes are not uh, really there anymore. You cannot find them anymore. The transformation process, um, we covered it already for the IBSCs. Is it for the MSCs um, like the same approach or comparable? Um, like you introduce genes or transcription factors into the cells then? Yeah, it's actually the um, a, a fragment of the human telomerase gene. How it is exactly done, actually, I don't know. Uh, and it's really also... I think the uh, know-how of Eversight to uh, generate here stable cell lines is uh, this is certainly uh, something that is not really available from a lot of companies worldwide. So Eversight is here really one of the very few companies in the world who can do that successfully 
And we have, as I said, a, a, a small library of cell lines available from them from actually derived from different tissues and tested also for biological activity and so on. So the, these cell lines are fully tested, fully documented, and can also be used for GMP manufacturing, which is, of course, our mid-term goal yeah, to not only perform lab studies, not only to perform process development for laboratory uh, processes, but really to transfer this in, into GMP and um, produce clinical study material out of these cell lines. So MSCs, as you mentioned, are much more limited in their use. So if iPSCs could be used for any purpose, uh, why do you still keep on having MSCs? That's also a good question. MSCs traditionally have been, I think, tested in many different conditions just because of their natural uh, role that they play, which is also in keeping tissues, uh, organs in a good state, right? So they also secrete um, interesting vesicles, for example, which have regenerative potential. And this is, I think, the reason why these cell types are uh, so popular in research and also explored for therapeutic purposes. You partly mentioned it already, but in this stem cell expansion, uh, how does Fenestra handle this, particularly with these two types? And like, are there some major challenges that you are facing? Certainly, there are major challenges. First of all, what I think is also important to know is that we work strictly under serum-free conditions. So we don't use any serum or also uh, animal components in our media or in our cultivations overall. And if you look into the industry or into also into publications from academia, this is by far not the standard. This makes certainly technological developments more challenging. And we see the future in a serum-free media. And in the end, also, of course, animal-free. For regulatory reasons, I think this uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, the expansion of induced pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs, has been pretty straightforward in our hands, simply as they are very active, they grow very fast, and this is why they love our pH control in our bioreactors. They produce a lot of lactic acid, and uh, in our bioreactors, we can at least correct the pH and also feed additional media so that they can grow for a certain amount of time and expand to very high cell densities. Uh, for the mesenchymal stromal cells, the MSCs and specifically the telomerized ones we are using, it has been a, a tougher ride, I have to say. It was a tougher nut to crack. These cells prefer really adherent uh, conditions. The IPCs grow in spheroids and mm -hmm. uh, grow very well, as I said. The MSCs really uh, need a surface where they can adhere to. And uh, this means we have to use so-called microcarriers. And um, these microcarriers are then floating, for example, in bioreactors. And there might be some mechanical stresses also, which the cells, on the other hand, don't like. So we had to find a way to uh, still have enough surface in the bioreactor to have them grow, but on the other hand, have uh, limited or low mechanical stresses. And we are happy to say that we found a very good way. It's a proprietary setup, which we are currently also filing for a patent. That's really interesting. So when you are then arriving at the end product, when the cells have grown, what methods or techniques do you usually employ to isolate them and to purify them at the end? This depends very much on the product itself, mm -hmm. right? So what is actually then our product? Is it the cells? Is it the iPSCs, for example? As I said, they grow in spirits, so it's very mm -hmm. simple to harvest them in this state. Of course, one obvious thing is also that we do then a differentiation of these cells and uh, go further into a differentiated product. Yeah? So what we also, of course, do with the cells itself, we wash them, we concentrate them so with uh, filtration methods, with tangential flow filtration, for example, TFF. Extracellular vesicle production, of course, requires exactly the separation of the cell components and also of cell debris. So filtration is here one of the key methods 
to start with, and then we do also here tangential flow filtration to separate different sizes mm -hmm. of the secretome of cells, so to fraction it into different particle dimensions and so on. Mm -hmm. I also want to shed a bit more light on the culturing process. You mentioned a lot of buzzwords like serum-free, xenon-free and purification. Why is it actually so important to have a highly purified end product? Yeah, of course, um, there are different aspects to it. I think it's not necessarily so important that um, the product is uh, highly pure. It needs to be safe, right? So first of all, safety is very important. You have to mitigate any safety risks for patients. And this can come from cell lines, of course. This can come from uh, materials that we use from certain byproducts that we produce, right? Um, second is that we have to really um, define our product. You know, the authorities want us to understand what is active and why it is active. This is the primary reason why we currently do a lot of purification or separation also of, uh, for example, extracellular residues, right? To really understand what components are actually active in the meaningful functional biological assays. In the context of your IPSC bioprocessing, how do you currently address quality control and, and monitoring? We um, constantly monitor, for example, pH and temperature and also oxygen concentration. And of course, we have different opportunities also to supply gases as needed to these bioreactors. And in addition to that, we, of course, check the glucose levels. And we also measure key metabolites, uh, usually at line. And of course, microscopy is a very important piece of the analytical puzzle. So we check very regularly on the morphology, on the purity of the cells, how well are they doing. So the homogeneity of the cells, are there dead cells? The viability, of course, is, is a very important dimension. And the total cell count is, of course, very important because this also then defines the productivity that we reach in our processes for cell production or for vesicle production. What is also needed to really identify the cells, to also measure the right marker proteins, for example, MSC typical markers. And for the IPCs especially, also we look into the genetic integrity uh, and also we perform HLA typing because we also look into and will go into genetic engineering in the future. So HLA typing is one of the important characterization tools as well. I'm very interested in cell counting and characterization of cells. And you also want to bring AI into your processes, right? So implementing an image analysis platform to support your quality control and to optimize it. How do you envision that? Um, how can image analysis platform like ICOSA aid in your quality control? Yeah, this is, of course, something we, we explore uh, together with KML Vision already for quite a while. And I think what uh, is obvious, we have cells, we have uh, cell aggregates like spheroids, we have cells and surfaces. So we have a lot of, let's say, need for um, checking, for following our the cells, how are they doing, how, how the viability is, and how, what uh, the cell growth is, for example, overall. So I think there's ample opportunities uh, for image uh, and AI-led uh, image analysis, right? What specifically I think will drive also the implementation of the tools Cable Vision is developing, in my view, is also differentiation of cells, right? We are now going more and more into the direction to differentiate uh, IPCs into different cell types, and this in a bioreactor process. And this means, of course, uh, we have to uh, follow here also the cell state and follow how cells differentiate, how they actually change um, from IPS cells to progenitor cells and maybe to the cell type that we're actually aiming for and in what quantities also. So what is the residual uh, of uh, non-transformed cells and so on. So there will be specifications that we need to set. There will be also the question about reproducibility of uh, these processes. And I think image analysis is here really one of the important complementary tools that we will need to do this and also to demonstrate, for example, to regulatory bodies 
that we can do this actually, that we can control this process, that we can reproduce what we do, that we also can fulfill certain specifications. I think that's a very important aspect. Do you want us to say something, Elisa? I'm curious about using a, a platform like Icosa. Would you see it as a tool that comes in handy during production quality control or when you start using it more later stage like product efficiency? I would say even earlier than we did just mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to already start developing such a tool in parallel to developing a product, right? Or to mm -hmm. developing a process to generate, to manufacture actually a product. And of course, I think looking into manufacturing then even more, I think such tools are, are very important. Uh, we have done process modeling already um, 15 years in the biopharmaceutical industry or, or longer. We are using the golden badge principle to uh, try to better understand and also maybe to control our processes better. I think something similar will come, of course, also to the cell and gene world or is already being mm. implemented. Also, I think uh, process modeling has arrived already in cell and gene as well. And I think um, image analysis is obvious to be a very important tool here, especially for um, differentiation purposes, right? When we really have to look at different uh, cell types uh, with different shapes uh, and so on, different features that can also be followed microscopically. I think that's obvious that these tools here can really play a pivotal role. And also, I think there's always like this balance you try to keep because you mentioned costs and risks or mm. safety measures, but on the other hand, you need productivity, like a good workflow. So do you see a tool like Acosa aiding with that or even shifting it to more productivity and less costs, less risks? Yeah, of course. I think the expectation uh, for Acosa also to be able to detect early when processes, for example, deviate and uh, when an intervention might rescue actually a batch, right? And this is, of course, also true for the products uh, which we aim for. And uh, so it's obvious if you can rescue batches because we early detect deviations which we can fix, then this is, of course, a very important tool also to keep our cost low. On the other hand, as I said, fast analysis and better understanding of what is going on and maybe also faster development can also be a, mm. uh, an argument, right? So to get more out of one experiment, right? Just because you use additional tools and we know the human eye doesn't see everything, right? And also yeah. analytical methods are only testing what they are designed for. And so I think it's very important for us to have orthogonal methods uh, in characterization of our products. And I think image analysis is an important element of orthogonal methods. I mean, you can basically train the software for each and every pattern, right? So um, whatever you're interested in, you're going to annotate the images, train your application with it, and you can analyze it. So um, there is a, a great chance to to also gain insights into or to gain data which you don't know yet, right? Exactly. I think this is the expectation that here one plus one will be three and not two. But of course, there we need so the expertise of the KML vision team. Uh, and I think jointly we can create here um, exciting opportunities. So let's maybe dive a bit into the process itself of quality control. If you introduce the cells into the bioreactor, how could the workflow look like? So um, you're going to start bioprocessing it and when do you take the first sample? The first sample is the seeding or the inoculum, right? Checked for, for example, for uh, viability, of course, and also for um, certain cell markers. And then, of course, you usually take samples daily. You uh, look at the metabolites and the nutrients in a daily manner. By reactor controlled parameters are continuously measured. So if there is the pH deviating, of course, this is um, controlled um, immediately uh, online. Um, other things are done offline. And also, of course, uh, we look at uh, different uh, aspects. If we produce uh, extracellular vesicles, for example, we, we look at also the count of particles in the supernatant and so on. And this could be on a daily or in a, in a 
by daily mana, for example. So it's not necessary to do this every day, but in a regular manner, you check here your culture and also calculate your productivity from that. Mm -hmm. You talked about assessing the viability of cells. If you're taking a sample, are you taking then face contrast images or how do you assess the viability then or the cell, how do you count the cells? Yeah, usually we do some staining. So this is, we use calcine for uh, live cells and DAPI for dead cells. And so there is a, a life dead ratio. And uh, happy to say that usually we will see very, very few dead cells or blue, very little blue, a lot of green in our cultivations. That sounds good, yeah. I also can imagine maybe assessing the yield or the end product, right, with, with ICOSA. Would also be a use case, for example. Exactly. And uh, I think this is also uh, one of the aspects we're very much interested in <clears throat> to online be able to say uh, where we are with our culture regarding growth, performance, uh, uh, viability, maybe even. And of course, this needs maybe some additional um, engineering tools or, or, or opportunities. Uh, but yeah, I think this is also something we are very open for uh, and we also know other partners who might be interested in developing jointly some new opportunities for looking at uh, cultivations mm -hmm. what we didn't clarify yet is which cells if we compare ipscs and msc's which are easier to to process easier to expand and certainly the ipscs um, as they really grow very well in our hands they grow also as, as fair rates, as I said before, so they don't need a surface, right? So they self-organize in small aggregates, which then expand over time. And these small aggregates, actually, they are hollow in the inside, so they don't even have nutrient limitations, at least in the in the size or in the diameters that we are going up to. Yeah? And they uh, can be expanded within a few days uh, to many millions uh, per milliliter, which is, of course, an excellent basis then for performing uh, other processing steps, for example, differentiation. On the other end, the MSCs, as I said, they are very delicate. Uh, our team calls them divas sometimes <laughs> um, because they don't like uh, mechanical stresses um, and they lack like surfaces. So this is a little more of a challenge to develop here a platform, but uh, we are really happy to say that we have now uh, a proprietary setup, which is very productive for cell expansion and also for particle production or vesicle production, and uh, which we are also filing for a patent currently. How long does it actually take you, let's say, from the start of inoculation to the time where you want to yield it or until you reach the end volume of cells? So for the IPCs, it's just four to five days. Then we have uh, really expanded the cell mass and uh, they uh, slow down their growth. We could have probably expanded this a little bit by different feeding strategies, but so far there was no need for that. For um, MSCs, we are overlooking into an expansion which goes over seven to ten days. And then uh, usually we have reached a maximum on our support and go into perfusion mode. That sounds quite quick to me, actually. Yeah. Really quick. The goal in the end is to have a clinical translation, basically, at a clinical use. Mm -hmm. Because you said that the MSCs are the divas, the more delicate ones. Would you still consider them then for obvious reasons to be more like lagging behind in achieving like a future clinical translation or use? Not necessarily. I think the big question is, of course, as I said before, um, where is the activity, right? And yeah. how can a therapeutic modality be defined and, and produced and to be honest, uh, regarding the MSCs, I'm a big believer in the vesicles. Mm -hmm. um, so not so much the cells themselves as a product, which could also be, of course, but I think we have seen a lot of clinical studies based on MSCs with very limited success. I think what now comes more and more is um, that uh, the exocellular vesicles or products defined out of exocellular vesicle fractions can have very similar effects as the cells could have and are maybe easier to manufacture and also to apply. This, of course, needs to be proven. There was a recent uh, press release, I think, from a U.S. company who have tested the cellular vesicle fractions out of their proprietary process, um, which was tested in a phase two study for 
acute respiratory distress syndrome, and they could show a dramatic decrease in mortality in the treatment arm of the study. And this, of course, shows the potential of uh, these uh, vesicles, especially in an acute condition, to affect immune reactions or the, the immune system of the patients in a positive way. I think also a big argument for this uh, vesicle is that there is no cells involved, so there are no concerns like uh, teratogenicity really a topic anymore. Uh, although I have to say that MSCs and also the telomerized MSCs mm -hmm. are regarded as fully safe and not uh, cancerogenic or uh, any other safety issues, to be honest. So this is anyway not a big problem or a big discussion but still um, can make life easier. Mm -hmm. So you are already now shifting the focus towards the vesicles or are you still giving the MSC, the cells, a chance? We give them a chance, of course. We are ready to produce MSCs for any interested partner or customer. But um, our own efforts go very much into first differentiating of IPCs mm -hmm. and the other uh, efforts are going into the vesicular type of products uh, to test them further also in different disease models and create meaningful data, which can then also be a starting point for going further into uh, development of therapeutics. It's really interesting. And are there any efforts or do you plan to also work together with similar companies that are following the, the same goal to just collect more data, to basically have a cumulative register? Of data? Of course, that's very, very important and a very good question. I think similar is, is KML Vision and Fenestra work together. We have a network of partners which help us to master this complexity that we're working on, right? So it's, mm -hmm. I think, a small company like Fenestra couldn't do this alone. And so we work with several other partners who have uh, excellent uh, opportunities or uh, capabilities available to do this and to make steps forward to collect data on these very complex products. You mentioned regenerative um, medicine. Are there any other therapeutic areas that you consider equally important or, or that you're targeting? Regenerative medicine is actually a very broad term, yeah. right? So we are looking really into, into indications or conditions where we believe that anti-inflammatory properties or anti-fibrotic properties, which is really found a lot in our uh, vesicles and can make an impact, a positive impact. So where we can say, okay, these inflammatory properties um, and maybe also boosted with engineering can make a difference. What we are focusing on to also be able to give a proof of concept on a preclinical uh, level. And uh, mm -hmm. I think here we really have to focus and then also take this data and go out and look for partners who can help us take this further. Because clearly I come from the biopharmaceutical industry, so I know what it takes to develop therapeutics, right? From a, um, a competency standpoint, so the, all the different uh, The capabilities that you have to combine and the cost that run up. Mm -hmm. So and the different this phases. is of course a major, the different mm -hmm. phases. Uh, this is a major undertaking, and uh, we're just at the very, very beginning of the journey. Yeah, I think this is a very important aspect, especially for startups and and small companies as we are. Uh, we need to join forces to complement each other and. The great advantage we have is, as a small company, we are very flexible, right? Um, and I think um, this is uh, could be key to to make something very big, right? Absolutely. And, um, you know, what I always feel is also that some people think, oh, why should you be successful, right? Why, why, why are not others doing this already if it's really um, promising? Yeah? But as you said, we are the innovators in the industry. The big farmers are not the innovators, they buy innovations. So I think it's really on us to come up. And as I said, it's exactly the point. We are flexible, we are agile, and we can really um, create synergies by joining forces. So fully agreed with your statement. And um, I think this is really why I believe also that we are fully on the right track because one plus one 
always in that setting gives three and this is hardly achieved in the biopharma industry <laughs> i mean mm -hmm. I, I was there for a long time and it's a great place to learn and um, i think we brought a lot of products to the market but the innovation really usually comes from the outside exactly yes and what would you say are um, the most exciting developments and breakthroughs on the horizon in stem cell and extracellular vesicle research space from my perspective and this might be really i'm, I'm biased here right so i think um looking at the ipcs and the great potential of induced pluripotent stem cells which is still not really harvested right why is it not harvested i believe we need of course ipcs that are engineered so that they can be applied directly or in the form of differentiated cells to patients without immunosuppression so you asked about the next uh, exciting thing i think it will be yeah universal cell line or universal ipc library better better to say because it will not be one cell line but a certain number of cell lines which can really make cell therapy successful without immunosuppression the second one i think is really in the vesicle field uh, the extracellular vesicles are also nano vesicles which are actually created out of cells by processing by engineering uh, where you also maybe package a few things, um, you maybe also uh, enhance uh, tissue targeting beyond their natural capabilities and so on. So make really yeah, smart shuttles out of these vesicles using, and I'm a big believer of, of nature, yeah? so I don't want to engineer everything from the beginning. I don't want to engineer everything into these vesicles, but I think the better strategy is to take natural capabilities of these vesicles and enhance them and use them done for a lot of different therapeutic applications. And it could also be that they somewhere replace uh, the viral gene therapy. So non-viral gene therapy would be my vision here as well. So let's see if this works out. Yeah, certainly an interesting field. So as we wrap up, um, is there any additional information or any insights you would like to share with us um, about Fonestra's work, goals, or a broader landscape of stem cell processing? I feel that we have, of course, started to systematically address uh, certain topics. And uh, mm -hmm. I think systematic work pays off. It's maybe not uh, always uh, funded well. It's not... Uh, always uh, easy to uh, sell these uh, types of projects to investors. Uh, but I'm happy to say that uh, it bears fruit and that we, of course, found support from investors, also from funding bodies. I think we have to really be thankful to, especially also Austrian funding bodies who believe in us and who support us as much as they can. And of course, I think what is the most important thing is a great team. And uh, I'm happy to say that we have a really talented, motivated and focused and inspired team, which carry all this work forward, not only inside, but also together with others. So there's a lot of interface management as well. I think this is really what makes me extremely happy and also confident that we will be successful on this journey. And of course, uh, great collaborations with a great network of partners which is never boring and always fun, Al almost <laughs> always fun. <laughs> yeah, we are actually very happy to name us as one of your collaborating partners. Likewise. We're definitely going to keep an eye on it and very looking forward um, um, to see the progress in the future and um, yeah, how everything uh, works out. Yeah, I'm also very excited to what the future holds. And yeah, thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you very much uh, for doing all these efforts was fun talking to you and uh, I wish you all the best and we will keep in touch. It was my pleasure. Thank you to have you here. Thank you everyone for listening. Let us know if you like our work by following KML Vision on LinkedIn, signing up for our bi-weekly Inside AI in Life Sciences newsletter or subscribing to our podcast. Find more information in the description. Bye.